We're first going to look at some evolutionary trees. These trees help us to conceptualize and categorize biodiversity. Evolutionary trees can also be called phylogenetic trees. A phylogeny is the evolutionary history of organisms. So these phylogenetic trees are going to be one way that we can look at the evolutionary history of organisms and which other groups are closely related to them. We can see that in some cases our classification system matches very well with these phylogenetic trees. In this case we have order aerodactyly, which has to do with the number of toes these animals have. There are two families here, bovidae and cervidae, and then four genuses, so the branch, tree branches four times for each genus, and then four species that correspond with the four animals at the top. I want to point out though that this is not always the case. Sometimes our traditional classification system does not reflect the evolutionary history of the animals. And in these cases, we're often recategorizing, regrouping, and reorganizing our classification system. Let's look at some of the basics of how to read an evolutionary tree or a phylogenetic tree. We're going to start with the nodes or branch points. These nodes show us the point of divergence where two groups branched and started to become different. This also shows us the site of a common ancestor. On this tree, this node here is the site of a common ancestor for mice, rats, humans, birds, and fish. Trees have many branch points or nodes along them. Here we see another branch point. This is the common ancestor of mice, rats, humans, and birds, but not fish. Fish branched earlier and are not included in this lineage. We can see another common ancestor here, this one for mice, rats, and humans. And again, it does not include birds because birds branched earlier and are behind this common ancestor. And the last common ancestor on this tree is between mice and rats. These two groups are closely related therefore close on the evolutionary tree. Because rats and mice are so closely related and they have a very recent common answer, we say that these groups are sister taxa. It's important to note that when we look at these nodes or branch points, these evolutionary trees can be rotated along those branch points without actually changing anything in the tree. So we see that this tree over here the mice and the rats are still sister taxa. Even though this tree has been rotated on its node, this is the same tree because the relationships are the same. These trees can have species at the end of the branches or they can have major taxa or groups from our classification system. We can look here again and find examples of sister taxa. So the badgers, Taxidia taxis, and the otters, Lutra lutra, are sister groups. And then the Canis latrans, the coyotes, and the Canis lupus, the wolves, are also sister taxa. And you remember, our nodes are the site of common ancestors, so every time we see a branch point, we know that there's not only a common ancestor, but this is a point of divergence where the two groups have become different. This tree is another example of how our traditional classification system, so order, family, genus, species, lines up very well with an evolutionary tree. So order carnivora is one branch. We see that Felidae branched first. Okay, it's a family. The Mustelids and the can uh, Canidae, so dogs, weasels, and their ancestors branched separately. And there are four genuses with the five different species at the ends. Here's a practice question. Which animals are more closely related according to this phylogenetic tree? Take a minute to figure this out. The correct answer is crocodiles and birds. These taxa are closely related. They're sister taxa because they have a recent common ancestor and they are located right next to each other on this phylogenetic tree. The overall goal of phylogenetics is to determine evolutionary relationships and place all living organisms into monophyletic groups. A monophyletic group 
is a group in which all individuals are closely related to each other, and they're more closely related to each other than to any other outside group. This means that when we place these organisms onto a phylogenetic tree, a monophyletic group will include a common ancestor and all the descendants branching off of it. Here's an example. We can see that birds and crocodiles are a monophyletic grouping. We can include common ancestor A, birds, and crocs, and have everything that branches off of it. So this is monophyletic. We want to put together the group reptiles, crocodiles, and lizards. This is not a monophyletic group. We have common ancestors A and B included, and some of the descendants, but not all of them. Because the birds are left out, this is not a monophyletic group. When constructing evolutionary trees, we use comparisons of traits and DNA to help us determine the relatedness of the organisms. In this example, we see different traits, and we look at whether these organisms have them or do not have them. So in this case, the retractable claws are seen in both lions and hyenas, but not in bears and wolves. The number of ear bones in lions and hyenas are two, but only one in bears and wolves. And the more similarities these animals have, the more closely related they are. So we see in this example, African lions and spotted hyenas are sister taxa, which are more closely related to each other than they are to the other groups. Black bears and gray wolves are sister taxa, more closely, closely related to each other than they are to the other groups. We can also do DNA-based evolutionary trees, where we compare differences in DNA base pairings to determine relatedness of these organisms. Again, when we compare these organisms, we see that there are more similarities between species 1 and species 2 than there are to the others. This makes species 1 and species 2 more closely related, so on this tree they are sister taxa. The most accurate phylogenetic trees tend to use the most types of data they can find, both physical features and DNA sequences. The more evidence you have to back up your phylogenetic tree, the more strongly supported your hypothesis is. We have to keep in mind, though, that similar structures don't always reveal common ancestry. We have looked at analogous structures before, traits that look similar but have come from different evolutionary lineages and have arisen because of convergent evolution. We see that wings in bats and wings in insects are analogous. They are both meant for flight, but they evolved independently. We see many analogous structures. The shape of a seal, a dolphin, a shark, and a penguin are all hydrodynamic these animals are all torpedo shaped. However, these animals are not closely related. Two are mammals, one's a fish, and one's a bird. This means that this trait has arisen through convergent evolution because they all live in a similar aquatic habitat. Remember, these analogous structures have arisen due to convergent evolution. They are the opposite of homologous features or homologous traits. These are features that have been inherited from a common ancestor. These traits may look slightly different or have variations on a theme, but they are similar due to common ancestry. A good example of this are the bones found in the forelimbs of tetrapods. All four-legged animals have the same bones in their arms, even though they are modified in different ways for different lifestyles. So how do we figure out if a trait is homologous or analogous? One way is to observe multiple traits in an organism to determine relatedness. Another way is through DNA analysis. We can also find the opposite to be true, that some animals and some organisms that do not look very similar may be closely related. A good example of this is the African golden mole and an African elephant. The mole and the elephant are more similar to each other based on their DNA sequence than the golden mole is to the common shrew, even though the common shrew and the golden mole may look more similar with using their physical features. DNA sequences often reveal closely related organisms 
and hidden evolutionary histories that we were previously unaware of. Many scientists are working to place all living organisms into one giant phylogenetic train. There are three major domains of life or categories that all of these organisms are divided into, domain bacteria, domain archaea, and domain eukarya. We're not going to delve into the diversity of life for this chapter in this class. In summary, we've looked at the phylogenetic trees and the basics of how to read one. Be sure to look back at the learning objectives posted for this lesson.